be very uh, Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to ACE 12. Appreciate you all coming out this afternoon and uh, coming to join us. As I think most of you know, ACE is generally about uh, startups, but we are having a, a, a special panel today looking at those companies that have been successful startups and now moved on to second stage companies. And so I think it will be very uh, interesting and illuminating for everybody. I want to start with our moderator, Nancy Bosi, who runs the Growth Group at the Small Business and Technology Development Center, which is focused on second stage companies. And yep. The SBPDC, as we call ourselves, as we provide no cost business consulting, um, low cost training, and we provide um, market research to help our companies grow. And with us today, I have two of our growth specialists. We have Al Bacon, Chris Olson. So, um, you know, they brought their their clients along and we thank our small business owners for being here today because as you know how busy the world is with the small business um, owner uh, realm so thank you all for coming today too and um, it, the plan is we will have them talking we'll ask a few questions the last 15 or 20 minutes we'll open it up for um, question and answer on your part so that you will get to ask your questions and answers and so why don't we start with Liz right hi <clears throat> My name is Lynn Perenic. I'm the owner and president of RG Tate and Label, conveniently located off the Six Mile and 275. Um, I have an interesting story, at least I think it's interesting. We are a stage two company, um, but I have only had owned the company for two years. It was originally a stage two company when my husband bought it in 1994. Um, it was primarily pharmaceutical uh, labels that they did. Through a course of events, um, it went, the sales went, started at five million and by 2009, we're at 792,000. So, I'm a special ed teacher um, by design, I guess. And so I love a challenge. I retired, I was doing some other little things, and so I said, I think I can do this. And then I saw this bushel basket of a business, and I went, ah. But we've slowly turned things around um, with an 86% increase in sales in 2010, a 43% increase in sales in 2011, and we're looking at a 30% growth in 2012. Um, I guess my focus, I don't know how long you want me to go on, my focus and, and where I came to um, look, look to finding um, my my sensei for um, open book maverick open book management was first the book maverick which have you heard of this book it is a book of ricardo semler and the company simco it's a brazilian company it was ricardo's father's business and he took it over and transformed it really transformed it made it so much larger and so much more than the scope of what his father had. Then I, I looked into the great game of business. And this is Jack Stack, took over International Harvester, and with his philosophy, it's doing great, and he used open book management. And my last <coughs> inspiration starts right here in Ann Arbor from Zingerman's, and it is building a great business. Ari Wine's way. And so the thing that I did that is probably the most different for a second stage business is that we went completely open book, which means my employees think like business owners. They have been taught how to read an income statement, they own lines on the income statement, and they can tell you on a daily basis how my business is doing. Right now, um, we're in a crunch for end of month, and I have every man, woman, on duty to make sure that they get product shipped so we meet our goal. 
It's very empowering to your employees, um, and it really affects your bottom line. I mean, I really credit the, uh, the growth in sales to my whole team. I mean, every, from the pressmen to the salesmen to the accountant, everybody knows what, what's going on and how they, they themselves can affect the bottom line. Thank you. Okay. So, I did. <laughs> <laughs> who can tell me what SEO is? Students. Who 
maintain a focus on the fact that, that you are the visionary. You, you have a company that's growing because you have a talent or a skill or something that, that you're bringing to the table that is not possessed by, by everyone. And if, if you get trapped into that process where you're part of the production facility, then I, I think that can, can be a real limitation on your ability to um, use your talent. And so at a certain stage, I, I realized that I need to make sure while I was, I was delegating things, I needed to continue to do that and get even some of those um, functions that were, were dear to my heart. I mean, critical for the business. I needed to start to move those things out of my realm and into someone that could continue to move those, those things forward. Um, the company that we worked with actually kind of brought this down to something that I thought was, was really good. Uh, the individual asked me, are you working in your business or are you working on your business? And I realized, of course, at the time that I was working in my business, my business needed me in order to, to do its day-to-day -day operations. I needed to get to the point where I was working on where the business was going, what it was going to do, and what the next step, the next new product or service was. So I think that was one of the, the important things that I, that I felt was a big change in the area of my mindset. So you mentioned that the business needed you, and you needed to work on your business, and that
you have a craftsman who, who, who doesn't care and is making $18 an hour, he can, he can make bad parts and, and just go through that $3,500 log in no time flat. But when your craftsman knows the cost of poor quality and how that's affecting your bottom line, they care. Because when we have meetings, we say, you ran 20,000 bad parts. We had to replace them. We had to do them over again. So it was material, it was labor, it was shipping, and, and more importantly, it was our reputation. And people start to care. So for me, that was a, that's a huge paradigm shift from me being the only one that has a vision and me being the only one that's leading the company forward. Everybody has a vision. My pressmen, it was so cute. I mean, I had them all write their vision. I want you to write what you want this company to look like in three years. And he said, oh, you know, I don't know, this is a pretty hard homework assignment. And I said, well, do the best you can. Tell me what, what do you want? What do you want that press room of yours to look like? Well, I'd like to have three full-time press men, and I'd like to have one helper and one setup guy. And he started going, I said, that's right. And if you make good parts, that's a great vision. That helps my company grow. It helps our company grow. And we did the same thing with the county. And the same thing, you know, with um, our quality chip. And, you know, what do you want this business to look like? We all need to work together on it. It's not just me. I can tell you what I think, and you can think I'm full of baloney. But if we all get together and we all see this vision, and then, and here, this was critical. They all signed off on the vision. This is what we're going to do. I put my name on it. I'm, you know, we're not moving around here. We all are totally committed to making this happen. And, and you don't get that, it's not my job. You know, I, it's not, I'm not saying like it's not my job. It's, it's her job, or it's his job. So it's a different type of a leadership role. It's not an author, authoritarian, I'm the boss of you kind of a thing. It's everybody thinking like they're the, an owner and, and seeing really results and sharing in the rewards of the company. So for me, that's how it is. I'm thinking about, we have any bankers in here? Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> so, when you're thinking about finance with your business, and how has your relationship with your bank changed mm -hmm. over the years, and how do you manage that relationship? So, go ahead. Sure. sure. So, Catherine and I actually started the company bootstrapping it. We started the company bootstrapping it from, uh, fam from family. Um, but over time, the Bank of Mount Arbor is our bank, and they trusted us, and we trust them. We were able to set up our line of credit and uh, equipment loan, uh, our equipment loan, and, and uh, we don't. We had we had drawn on it for a very long time, but when we had to, we paid it right back. So we just maintain um, good credit with them, and I think the lines of communication helping were very.
you know, I think I think that um, banks certainly have, you know, a future in your future, but um, I think you need to be cautious. And I think 0809 months in. You know, I mean, 0809 was tough. I mean, it was really tough. It was, you know, when you sign on the line, you're cross collateralized. If, the banks weren't, weren't liking too many people back then. So, um, I don't know about you, but I didn't have like $10 million in my checking account. So, I know. So, be cautious with banks is, is my, you know, borrow wisely. And no. Um, I don't know that I can say our, our relationship has changed a whole lot. For, for our company, we're, we're situated in more rural community. Um, so working with the local banks um, has always been a challenge for us. They, if you have $10 million in the bank, they're willing to lend, lend you $10 million. Uh, otherwise, um, they, they just, uh, they, they, they want to secure investment as, as best as they can. Um, I think, uh, Uh, again, we, we've, we've, we've uh, secured some loans in the past, but uh, it, it's, it's a difficult process and, and certainly it was only uh, for the most strategic uh, place in the key uh, times for our business. Um, I think the, the only real change is, is, is really for us, uh, we just recently began working with the uh, SP, SPTDC and um, I think that has given us some insight, really, to uh, how we can move into uh, some of the more elaborate financing opportunities there, to, to really understand how to get our, our financials in a presentable way that, that is just going to streamline that process and allow us to present the things that, that the banks want to see and the ratios and all of those sorts of things. Um. You've all increased your sales. Congratulations, we like that. Added jobs. So when you think over the, the course of your history, what is the biggest change that you've seen happen in your sales efforts? What 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 um what what have you done? Who wants to go? Good. Well, I, when when you're small, when you're just starting out, and again we manufacture, um you'll you take any job that you can get. <coughs> I looked at it like, sort of like being in high school. You know, you have projects, you've got quizzes, you've got tests, you've got a lot of things that are propping up your income. Um, when you're in college, you have a midterm and a final and maybe a paper. Well, I didn't want, I didn't want to go that route, but I didn't want to stay with just a bunch of little stuff. So we've, we've now looked at pay dirt, I've been watching the Alaska Mining Show. Um, and we know that those are our current customers. That's, that's what we, we know. We can get repeat sales there. But we look, we're mining new territories. And more importantly, and most importantly for us, we're going after the whales. We're going after Delphi. We're going after Procter & Gamble. We're going after you know larger companies that really, when you're a little guy, and you're just starting out, they, they want to see, you know, your DMV, they want to know your capability and your capacity, and they don't really even care about your line of credit when you're busy saying, but wait, I've got this line of credit, and I might not have this equipment right now, but I can buy it. They don't want to hear it. So now that we are in a more stable position and we're moving into stage two, we're now looking at the whales. And you, you get a couple of whales in there, and you, and it really helps you to be a much more sustainable business. Um, well, for us, um, we, we are a, a retail industry, so we're, we're selling to the uh, general public. And um, er, early on in our company's history, so certainly once we got into the internet, um, we had the luxury of having a, a unique product that effectively sold itself. When you're, when you're the only local dial-up uh, internet uh, company in town, um, marketing was easy, right? You just had to put up our name and our product and, and the, the people came to us. And, and uh, that persisted for several years. We, we, we 
were able to skate by on, on a minimal marketing uh, process. But uh, times have changed. The, the big boys are, are uh, in the market now. Frontier, at and Comcast, those, those guys. Those guys have some, some marketing budgets to reckon with. And so we, uh, uh, it, in recent years, we've really come to the realization that, that um, there has to be a, a concise plan and a, a focused effort on, on that process. Uh, We've, we've begun uh, earnest effort to make sure that we have a marketing plan in place for the year. And I think most importantly, again, from the from retail side, um, the tracking mechanisms are, are very, very important. Um, it, it's easy to, to talk to the, the Yellow Pages folks or the billboard people and, and, and get lots of advertising dollars pumped out there and you know great looking billboards or great looking yellow pages ads but um you know for the executive who's looking at spending these dollars you really want to know okay what am i getting for these dollars and so getting those tracking mechanisms in place is, is, a, is a key component using uh, specific uh, telephone numbers in your ads or coupon numbers or things like that have really been a uh, something that, that we're zeroing in on so we can find out what works and, and we learn things. We really do learn some interesting components. Uh, we learned this year that a radio station that, that covers our local area that I thought nobody listened to turns out to be one of uh, the better vehicles for us to reach our, our wireless market, which is uh, a very rural uh, component. Uh, so certainly those will implement, um, implementing those tracking mechanisms. And again, for TC3, just our experience in a rural setting, um, we found that participation in local events is, has real returns. Just getting there, putting up at the high school basketball games, uh, things like that uh, are, are truly uh, get your presence out there. Thank you. So our sales. Well, I was a salesperson to begin with, and I ran around town, and David Bloom remembers me <laughs> back way, back when nobody knew what SEO was, but I you promised it would work. It's the internet. The internet's always right. And um, so I took as, we took as many people as we could in, in, in small businesses, um, and then we all of a sudden got a really big dish. And then, as we started to work on this really big pitch, another one came, and another one came, and another one, and another one, and another one. And then as we're doing this, and we're, we're really, our analysts are getting into the work, we stopped, and we, we took a look at everybody, and we asked them, what do you most enjoy about this job? What are you really passionate about? They love the big, juicy clients, the big, juicy problems the complexities of a website with lots of information and content and, and it has a ton of issues because everybody in this room, if you, if you own a business, you have a website and you're constantly redesigning it, right? Or you're in the middle of redesigning it. And as you begin redesigning it, you realize there's issues with technology, the platforms you're going to be using. You know, and then all of a sudden Google changes something like every day. And then you've got Facebook, and then you've got Twitter, and you've got LinkedIn, and all these wonderful new ways to promote yourself, and your website's affected by all of them because that's still home base for everybody to come back to. So our sales efforts soon turned to Sandler Sales. We invested in a membership with Sandler Sales, and we had our, Catherine and I go through training. A few other members of our team took training. That definitely helped. And then we went ahead and hired one salesperson. And she was amazing. So we had hired two. Yeah. We're on two now. It's really cool because I'm not the only one out there. And I think that sales is very important to every business, but also remembering just because you're a salesperson, it's not the only person selling. Every person in your company is selling. As they're delivering to the client, they're selling. So really, and then, and then when your client goes out there and they say nice things about you, they're kind of selling too. So you have to remember that. Everybody's, you're in it together. 
Um, and so that's, that's, that's where I'm at with sales. I have even a marketing director now, too. <laughs> that's a big deal. I'm in shock. <laughs> no, no. That's, that that happens to your fault. Yes. <laughs> Okay. And the last question I'll ask, and then we'll open it up to the crowd for questions and answers. When you think of what is the biggest process that you've had to change or implement within your company as it moved into the second stage? Getting TS certified. Okay. Which is a quality quality certification is required <coughs> primarily by automotive. Um, not only is it costly, but you have to have specific processes that are documented. And so for my pressman, this, this proved to be an interesting feat because he sort of printed by magic. Now while his labels might have looked good, he didn't necessarily always have a repeatable process. And he didn't think it really mattered. Well, guess what? Toyota does. Misaki, yes. Denza, they're rejected. Um, so getting to have Getting to get us TS certified and get my people to have repeatable processes was really the biggest challenge. When you're stage one, you can be printing labels in your, in your garage, but you know when you're when you're playing playing in, in the big pond, you better make sure that you have all your ducks in a, in a row, and that when they, when they come in and they audit your processes, that they're absolutely food perfect. And that was. Uh, I, I think for me, um, in terms of process, or it really, I think delegation was the uh, was the key components that, that that had to evolve as our company grew. Um, you know, it's easy to bring on people, but, but to try to continue to, to offload processes or responsibilities. Um, it became a challenge, and um, for me, I, I just learned that, that the process of delegating had to be a very defined process. It had to be a very clear communication for myself or, or even my managers. They had to pick up the same practice that they had to clearly um, uh, communicate what, what was being delegated and, and what was uh, to be expected of, of that person. Um, email is a wonderful thing in, in my mind. Um, yeah, but it's easy to get into uh, meetings and long discussions about uh, what you're going to do or plans and things like that. Uh, but you walk away and, and somebody may take away from that meeting something different than, than what you may have uh, arrived at. And so uh, one of the practices that, that I put in place is that as, as we have these meetings, um, I follow everything up with a Kind of a summary email that makes sure that I touched on the things that, that uh, the high points of, of what the conversation entailed, what the action items were, and what the takeaways were, so that, uh, that it's established uh, that process had an end result, it's a clear direction, and uh, I, I just felt that that was probably one of the most important things that, that I had incorporated in my <coughs> business as we grow to be able to communicate that information. Going back to the EOS system, the EOS system, the entrepreneurial operating system I mentioned earlier, um, it is quite efficient. Um, it's something I mentioned earlier, the level 10 meetings, where you lay out your issues, you discuss and solve them. Not necessarily in that meeting, but you never use them. It's quite an interesting process to go through, that we have the best meetings now in the company, where we don't sit for two hours and still don't have a solution. Um, when we had crossed the line, we did our processes broke. A lot of things broke. The same things that we, the things that we used to do, didn't work anymore. There was there were expectations of uh, a performance management review. We had never done one of those. <laughs> we just expected everybody to do their work, and now we're implementing that, and it's rolling out quite nicely through the help of the EOS system. Um, another piece of this too is when when I. When I, it's lonely at the top. And you can't talk to your neighbor necessarily about the situations in, in your company. 
but you can talk to peers that are going through the same thing. So I joined a group called Entrepreneurs Organization. It's a global organization called, called EO. Um, 8,000 CEOs all over the world, and I can pick up the phone today and call any one of them and ask them for a story. They share stories, and it's not, it's not advice, and it's just thoughts. It's about, okay, have you ever experienced something like this, and how did you solve it? And it's awesome. So if you were able to find a group like that, I highly recommend that in, in helping you figure out what to do next because really you're, you're helping each other. There's a lot of uh, processes and things that can come up, especially with humans. Human beings, you can manage humans, all kinds of exciting stuff. We all we hired an HR person this year, too. <laughs> that was exciting. Marketing and HR. <laughs> yeah, but it, 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 human resources is just a, a very important area, and, um, and, and that handles the compensation packages and helps you understand what those need to be and how they should be laid out. At the end of the day, everybody needs a good bonus, and you still need to uh, have the profit, right? Mm -hmm. That's the profitability. Thank you. All right, your turn. Questions from the audience? Back there. So at what point, or have you already done this, are you looking at a, a board of advisors or a board of directors that, a board of advisors or a board of directors that will give you some key strategic partnerships and kind of Again, people like EO, the more embedded into your organization. I, uh, at, at this point, I can't say that, that TC3 is, is taking that step. Um, it, it, it certainly, I think, the option to, to join uh, organizations like EO, I think, are, are a great uh, opportunity for, for TC3. But, um, what about business mentors? Do you have business mentors that you can go to for advice? Sometimes. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I mentioned we're part of the WPO, the World Projects Organization. Um, and I have my husband, who I have dinner with every single night, who started um, his business 38 years ago. So, you know, and sometimes I have to say that he's sort of like Eeyore, you know, I've, I've just started this company and I'm Tigger and I'm on this side and he's like, lost my tail, looks like rain. And, but he has a lot of really good sound advice. Um, and, you know, and particularly in dealing with automotive, he'll say, ah, no, you don't want to do it. Don't trust them, they're going to eat your lunch. <laughs> so. So we bounce things off of each other, and I think that we're we're our own board of directors, really. And he keeps loaning me money. Yeah. I'm talking to the banker tonight. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so the board of advisors, I think, is an important tool, and you don't necessarily need to pay them, which is really exciting. Um, you, you, you should sign a non-disclosure, however. <laughs> but but cho in choosing them wisely um, is important to have how will they uh, bring um, improvements to your business and how will they answer your questions and help you see things in a different light. Um, we, did, we did try that on for a little while, uh, but I am leaning more on entrepreneurs organization. Though. I am a communication chair and really involved at this point. <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I have... Um, I highly recommend it. Um, there's a lot of, all you have to do is ask. A lot of people don't realize this, but you just ask for help and someone will come. Yeah. Well, and I don't, again, I'm, I'm like you guys, we manufacture. So our one of our, our biggest suppliers is 3M. And 3M wants you to be successful because if we're successful, they're successful. So we bought $3 million worth of, of material, product from them. They will, they'd like us to have a 30% increase. So that if they have a new application, a new, you know, they're, they're no, now hot on die cutting with insulate. Um, so they will come and, and do presentations and they will actually give you leads. So. Another question? Sir? Uh, what's the largest problem you had to solve? And more importantly, what did you have to learn about?
there were a lot of questions. We didn't, we didn't understand the difference between finance and, and, and CPA. We kept asking the CPA questions that, that we thought she, that she should be able to answer, but she couldn't. It, because it was, they were finance questions. But we didn't know that. We didn't know better. So we just kept asking for everybody we knew questions. <laughs> and and um, we ended up hiring a business consultant, though. And, um, and, and that was an interesting experience. Um, and, and we had, we, that business, what, what I learned from the business, we had, so we had hired like maybe three business consultants. We spent a lot of money on that, a lot. And what I found was that we had the answer. It was inside of us. It was in, all along. It, we didn't miss, they helped us get to certain areas and to see things in a different way. But I, I mean, we actually spent thousands and thousands of dollars on business consultants. Not that I don't love them. I do love them. I think there are amazing ones out there. But in, in the beginning stages, as two women, you know, it's just one of those things. You have to choose who your business consultant is going to be wisely. And you had learned um, through a few failures that you know, some worked, some didn't. I got out of we got we got out of one situation wonderfully, <laughs> so, but it was tough. Charlie helped me, so <laughs> so yeah. It was, there, there are, um, just always remember inside of you, even when the things are really dark and you're like, there's no way in hell I'm gonna be able to do this. There's no way I'm gonna be able to come up with this much money. You still can. There's still a way. You find it. It just is there. C3, one of the um, one of the most difficult things that, that I had contend with was uh, kind of goes back to the component I was talking about there with um, maintaining the focus on on being the, the entrepreneur, the, the visionary, um, and, and getting away from uh, working in the company. Um, we got to a place where I had some some of my top people were uh, that I had in my organization. Um, that they were filling their their function, um, but it, they they really weren't pulling their weight there. And, and I began to realize that you know yes I've got some some high level management people involved, but uh, they are not allowing me to grow and. Came to uh, a, a tough point in the business where um, you know these were key people. Uh, so I had to make the decision that I, I've got to I've got to have people underneath me that can take on a high level of responsibility and, and take on some of those uh, uh, tasks that are dear to my heart and, and own them and, and move the company forward. And um, so there was a, a point where we had to, I had to transition some folks out of the company. Uh, I've been with the company several years, um, uh, some friends. Uh, but I had to, had to make a tough decision in order to be able to continue move the, the company forward. But you, you have to have, as you said, you have to have good people around you that can carry a portion of you. Well, and I agree with you. It sort of speaks to, to the year I was going in. As, as I, I told you, I sort of came into this business. It wasn't like I woke up and said, you know, I can't wait to work with a piece of crap. <laughs> 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 so, um, I love the smell of adhesive in the morning. <laughs> and so co coming into this business, um, I'll never forget the first day I arrived at work, you know, and I wear my hair in a ponytail, and it's mostly men that work there, and so I heard somebody behind me, they didn't know who I was, and I said, who's the blonde ponytail? And I thought, well, we'll see about this. So I, so I went and bought a Barbie, a pinstripe Barbie, for my, for my desk with the old 1950s blonde ponytail. That none, no, none of them knew that I had heard them behind me. So she was just standing there. And, then one of them, and I knew that they had accepted me 
when one of, one of the guys that were operating the laser made a, an acrylic ceiling for Barbie so that she could be pounding her, her fist through, through the glass, yeah, the glass ceiling. Um, but it was tough. You know, automotive is, is a man's world. I mean, it just is. And so breaking into that and, and gaining acceptance and credibility was, was huge. You know, I mean, I had this guy that had been running um, tape and label, and he said to me, so are you going to give me 20% of the business? And, you know, how do you respond to that? I said, I don't know, could you look out the window? And he looked, and I said, is hell freezing over?
again, going back to that, the fact that, hey, I'm, you are the visionary. All these people around you really do look to you for that leadership. So um, I, I think it's essential then that you, that you communicate that and share that uh, with, with the people around you. Let them know that uh, you know, you've got all these ideas in your head about what you want to do and, and where you want to take the company. Make sure you, you do disseminate that to them as much as, as you can and um, perhaps try to break that down into uh, achievable goals. I, I've really tried to, to adopt a process uh, where uh, at the beginning of the year, try to say here, this is, these are the goals and objectives for the company for this year. And, and see if we can, and, and certainly uh, elicit their participation in the process, but try to find out uh, you know, where the company is going to go and make sure they understand and <coughs> communicate that to them so that they know where they're, where, where you're headed. Well, if I had to distinguish between a manager and a leader, I would say Chesty Fuller is a leader. Thank you. And and I would say Don Draper from Mad Men is a manager. So there's there's a huge difference between the two of them. You get behind Chesty Puller and you you take the pill. Don Draper, I'm not so sure. Um, and that's what you need in, in your company. You need leaders. You need people that your employees will follow. That they'll say, you know what? I'll, you know, I'll go down, I'll fall on a grenade for you. You know, I mean, if somebody is, isn't a good manager, they'll say, well, you know, I'll work until five. You have to have people that, you want people in your organization that will follow you to the ends of the earth. And that's the kind of leader you have to be. You have, yesterday, you know, I mean, they, they teased me relentlessly, but I was out sorting parts with everybody else because I couldn't ask my people. I mean, I had the accountants, I had my CFO down there, I had HR down there sorting parts to get them out because today is the end of the month. And I couldn't ask them to go down and, and sort the damn seals, as they're called, um, if I myself wasn't willing to go there. You know, I mean, you have, you can't ask your people to do anything that you yourself would do. Um, and that's just how I lead. And now there were, I, I had the one guy who quit because he really couldn't fall in line with that type of management style. You know, he liked to hide. In open book management, there's no hiding. That's there's no hiding. Transparency. Yeah. Clarity. <coughs> yeah. Clarity. Crystal clear expectations. We got three minutes here, so we'll have to have one quick question. Can I get a purple? Well, in, in speaking to the transparency issue, then when as your companies are growing, how involved are your employees? Once you set your goals, how involved are they in developing the processes that are going to get you to those goals? Very involved. I mean, they're there. When you when you have a huddle, um, which is all of my people meet on Tuesdays, and they all have a line on the income statement, and they we discuss those lines and what's going on. They know, they problem solve. At my, my opinion is, as a business owner, I am, I am not the oracle of all answers to all, all problems. My pressman might have a better answer than I do on some process. You need to have them all contribute and all, and all buy in. Comments? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, we really need to all of the, uh, the hours up, so give me a chance to uh,
I forgot it all. <laughs>